On the back of the hand, the skin is thin and freely movable. This underlying layer of loose areolar tissue enables the skin to move. When the wrist and the MP joints are extended, the skin is loose and redundant. When they're flexed, it becomes tight. By contrast, the skin on the front of the hand is quite thick and much less movable. It's fixed to the underlying palmar aponeurosis by many strands of tough fibrous tissue. The creases on the palmar skin are lines along which the skin is thinner. The creases act as joints in the skin when the MP joints flex. It's easy to see where the MP joints are when we look at the back of the hand, but because of the way the skin slopes forward in between the bases of the fingers, the position of the MP joints can be a surprise when we're looking from the front of the hand. The MP joints aren't here, they're right back here, in line with the distal palmar skin crease. So fully half the length of the proximal phalanx of each finger lies beneath the skin of the palm. On the fingers, as in the hand, the skin is thin and extensible on the back, thick and deeply creased on the front. Let's take a close look at the specialized skin of the fingertip. The skin of the fingertip contains huge numbers of sensory nerve endings. The pulp of the fingertip is composed of fat interlaced with many fibrous strands which anchor the skin to the distal phalanx. The fingernail is a hard plate of keratin that's produced by the specialized epithelial cells which lie beneath its base here. A fold of skin overlaps the edge of the nail and adheres to it closely. We'll remove the skin on one side to see the full extent of the nail. Here's its edge. And we'll take away one half of the nail to see the underlying nail bed or nail matrix. Finally, we'll remove part of the nail bed. Here's the cut edge of the nail bed. It's closely adherent to the underlying distal phalanx. The actual nail-forming tissue is just here. It's the nail-forming tissue that produces this pale area, the lunula, that's visible at the base of many people's nails. Here's the flexor retinaculum. It's a tough, unyielding strap of fibrous tissue. The flexor retinaculum is the structure that forms the roof of the carpal tunnel. It's attached on the radial side to the scaphoid and the trapezium, and on the ulnar side to the pisiform bone and the hook of the hamate. As we'll see, the median nerve and all the flexor tendons to the fingers and thumb go through the carpal tunnel. The flexor retinaculum branches off in two places, here and here, to enclose two small separate tunnels. This one on the radial side encloses the tendon of flexor carpi radialis. This one, superficial and on the ulnar side, encloses the ulnar artery, palmar aponeurosis. It's a dense triangular sheet of fibrous tissue which covers the middle part of the palm of the hand. Proximally, it's continuous with the flexor retinaculum and with the tendon of palmaris longus. Distally, it separates into slips, which insert into the edges of the palmar plates of the MP joints. The palmar fascia protects the underlying nerves, tendons, and vessels from harm. The skin of the palm of the hand is frayed their direction of pull. In each finger, this structure, the flexor tendon sheath, provides the two flexor tendons with a smoothly lined, tightly enclosing tunnel to run in. The sheath starts just proximal to the MP joint and extends all the way to the distal phalanx. To see the sheath better, we'll divide it. Parts of the sheath are thick and fibrous, and parts of it are thin and collapsible. On this finger, we'll remove the thin parts of the sheath and just leave the thick parts. These act as pulleys for the flexor tendons, as we'll see. 
At each joint, the sheath is attached to the edge of the palmar plate. Between the joints, the sheath is attached along each phalanx. The floor of the tunnel for the flexor tendons is formed by the palmar plates and by the smooth, flattened surfaces of the phalanges. The thumb has a similar flexor tendon sheath for its one long flexor tendon. Here's the deep finger flexor, flexor digitorum profundus. It arises from the anterior and medial surface of the ulna and from the interosseous membrane. Here are its four tendons entering the carpal tunnel. We'll follow them in a minute. This adjoining muscle we'll see later on. It's flexor pollicis longus the long thumb flexor. Now let's add the superficial finger flexor, flexor digitorum superficialis, to the picture. Here it is. It lies right on top of the profundus. It has two heads of origin, a radial head and a humero-ulnar head. The humero-ulnar head arises as part of the common flexor tendon from the medial epicondyle of the humerus and also from the adjoining ulna. Its radial head arises from this long oblique line on the radius. Between the two heads, there's a gap which the median nerve and the ulnar artery both pass through. The four separate tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis are bundled together as they enter the carpal tunnel. Before we follow the superficialis and profundus tendons into the hand, we'll bring the forearm to the upright position. As the flexor tendons pass through the carpal tunnel, they're all enfolded within this common synovial sheath, which extends into the palm of the hand. Just as the flexor tendons emerge from the carpal tunnel, the four profundus tendons give rise to these four intrinsic muscles, the lumbricals. We'll be looking at these later. For now, we'll remove them to simplify the picture. Just before reaching the MP joint, the superficialis and profundus tendons of each finger enter the flexor tendon sheath together. To follow them, we'll remove the sheath. Over the proximal phalanx, the superficialis tendon splits into two halves, which pass around the profundus tendon. We'll remove the profundus tendon for a moment. The two halves of the superficialis tendon reunite, and as they do so, they insert here on the middle phalanx. The profundus tendon, here it is back in place, emerges between the two halves of superficialis and continues distally to insert here on the base of the distal phalanx. The action of flexor digitorum superficialis is to flex the proximal IP joint and the MP joint. The action of flexor digitorum profundus is to flex both the IP joints and the MP joint. The long flexor, flexor pollicis longus, lies deep in the forearm. We'll remove flexor digitorum superficialis to see it. Here's flexor pollicis longus lying alongside flexor digitorum profundus. It arises from the anterior surface of the radius and from the interosseous membrane. Its tendon passes through the carpal tunnel with the finger flexors. Here's the tendon of flexor pollicis longus emerging. It enters the fibrous flexor sheath of the thumb and inserts on the base of the distal phalanx. Flexor pollicis longus flexes both the MP joint and the IP joint of the thumb. Here's the median nerve next to the brachial artery. To see where it's going, we'll retract flexor carpi radialis. The median nerve first dives between the two heads of pronator teres. It then immediately passes between the two heads of flexor digitorum superficialis. The median nerve, here it is, passes down the forearm between flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. It emerges at the wrist to the radial side of the superficialis tendons. It's crossed by the tendons of palmaris longus and flexor carpi radialis. 
the median nerve passes through the carpal tunnel to reach the hand. It lies just beneath the palmar aponeurosis, which has been removed here. The median nerve gives off this small motor branch to the thenar muscles and then gives off these three common digital nerves. The common digital nerves break up into palmar digital nerves, two each for the thumb, index, and middle fingers, and usually one for the radial side of the ring finger. The medial nerve typically provides sensation to the medial half of the palm, the flexor aspect of the thumb, the index and middle fingers, and the radial side of the ring finger. Of the extrinsic hand muscles, the median nerve supplies flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor pollicis longus, and the radial half of flexor digitorum profundus. Of the intrinsic hand muscles, it supplies only the three thenar muscles and the radial two lumbricals. Lastly, let's look at the ulna nerve. As you'll recall from the last section, the ulna nerve enters the forearm by passing round the medial epicondyle and between the two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris. Here's the ulna nerve. It runs down the forearm between flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor digitorum superficialis with profundus deep to it. Here, it gives off a dorsal sensory branch, which goes to the back of the hand. At the wrist, it runs along the radial side of flexor carpi ulnaris. Along with the ulnar artery, it passes through the side tunnel in the edge of the flexor retinaculum. Here it is emerging from the tunnel. As before, the palmar aponeurosis has been removed. The ulnar nerve divides into a superficial branch and a deep branch. The superficial branch divides into palmar digital nerves for the little finger and typically the ulnar side of the ring finger. The deep branch passes between the hypothenar muscles. To follow it will remove the flexor tendons. The deep branch of the ulnar nerve runs across the palm in front of the interossei. It passes in between the two heads of adductor pollicis will remove the transverse head to reach the most radial of the interossei. The ulnar nerve typically provides sensation to the ulnar half of the back and the front of the hand and to the little finger and the ulnar half of the ring finger. Of the extrinsic hand muscles, the ulnar nerve supplies only the ulnar half of the flexor digitorum profundus. Of the intrinsic hand muscles, it supplies the hypothenar muscles, all the interossei, adductor pollicis, and the ulnar two lumbricals. Here's the radial artery in the forearm and at the wrist. The ulnar artery in the forearm. and at the wrist. The superficial palmar arch, common digital arteries and digital arteries and the deep palmar arch. Here's the radial nerve with its deep branch and its superficial branch. Here's the median nerve in the forearm and at the wrist with its motor branch, the common digital nerves and digital nerves. Here's the ulnar nerve in the forearm. Here's its dorsal sensory branch. Here's the ulnar nerve at the wrist with its superficial branch and its deep branch.